And I'm going to talk to you about where we think we are in, in understanding how climate is changing, both in its past, the present manifestations of climate change, and where we think climate is going to go in the future. And then I'll talk a little bit at the end about our plans here at Lawrence Berkeley to sort of start taking some next steps. What do we do now that we understand that climate is changing? I'm going to be representing the work of quite a few people. Uh, the assessment activities that we've just concluded are coming out under a, an organization called the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. It's a very ugly name for a very talented group of several hundred scientists who've spent the last uh, four years working very hard to understand how climate is changing, uh, what those changes mean for the impacts on plants, animals, and people, and how we might try to address those changes. And so I'll be stepping you through the findings from the report that deals with the science of climate change. And I'll be primarily focusing on how the climate, the physical climate has changed, not so much with the impacts on plants, animal society, because my work is really related primarily to the physical climate. And I'm going to be showing you some figures that are unfortunately fairly technical. This report is designed for a fairly technical audience, and even the figures that were designed for government ministers uh, still are beyond, I'm afraid, some of our, our, our current political leadership. And so um, <laughs> I will uh, show you those figures and then attempt to give you the take-home message uh, from some of the more technical graphs I'll, I'll present. I want to talk about a few key questions. First, how has this physical climate changed in the recent past? And then how does this relate to sort of the energy budget for the planet, the amount of energy that comes into the planet, the amount of energy that leaves, and how are we changing that? Can we figure out whether or not these changes are due to natural causes or whether or not they're induced by people? And I think this is really the $64,000 question that we have to answer. And I, I'm pleased to say that I think we have an unambiguous answer to this question now. Based on this evidence, then where do we think the climate will go in the future? And then because I'm an optimist, I want to end on some steps that we can take to begin to address these questions. So let me start with the evidence for physical climate change. And this is one of those issues where the evidence is literally all around us. Uh, let me start with Glacier National Park. This is a park I went to as a graduate student when I was earning my degree in astronomy and astrophysics. And I just wanted to show you one piece of evidence from this park that things have changed in this century. This is one of the, the glaciers in the park uh, just before the Second World War. This is that same glacier today, and as you can see, it's more or less collapsed. And there's uh, quite a large lake lying at, at its base, which wasn't present there only um, 70 years earlier. So there's lots of evidence right under, literally right under our noses that climate has changed. Now, the way that climate scientists tend to look at this is from a global perspective. So I'll be showing you a lot of evidence that's been it's been taken from the region, say, of Montana, and then aggregated up into a global score for the climate. And let me start with the most important score, and that's the Earth's temperature. And as I promised you, I'm going to show you a lot of fairly technical graphs, but I'll give you the take-home message. This, this left-hand graph shows you that the Earth's temperature has increased by about 3 quarters of a degree Celsius. Uh, since the middle of the 19th century, so since the start of industrialization. And it's increased everywhere where we've looked. It's increased on land, on oceans, and it's increasing faster on land than over oceans, although it's hard to tell that from this graph. So we have direct evidence, thanks to the work of Lord Kelvin uh, and his colleagues since then, who became quite fascinated with measuring temperature, that the Earth's temperature has increased. Now, there have been some scurrilous assertions made by people like Michael Crichton in his book, um, State of Fear, that this, was, uh, this is largely an artifact of the way that we measure temperature. And it's due to the fact that most of the thermometers are concentrated in cities. Well, the, the one thing, I, I won't go through this graph in detail, but the fact that this line is horizontal means that there is no trend in our temperature records because those thermometers are located in cities. In other words, Michael Crichton's State of Fear is unfortunately wrong. I should point out that he is the only uh, person who has met with uh, members of this administration on climate science, unfortunately. 
So his, his, view, his view is prevailing, but he's, he's, he's dead wrong. Now the temperature is changing not only at the surface, and again, this is one of these complicated graphs, which I won't go through in detail, but it's changing throughout the whole atmosphere. So not only the surface is warming, but the air all the way up to the upper part of the atmosphere that's well mixed, all of it has increased in temperature. While the stratosphere, the part of the atmosphere that holds the ozone layer, which is critical for life on Earth, that has been cooling. This signature of a warming lower atmosphere and a cooling upper atmosphere is completely consistent with our climate models of climate change. This is, in fact, a, basically a, a big fingerprint that is consistent with the fact that we are, we are the cause of climate change. And I'll come back to this point a little bit later. At the same time as we've been heating the atmosphere, the Earth's atmosphere has become moister. This is consistent with the basic laws of thermodynamics. And so the, the lower atmosphere, the so-called troposphere, is increasing in its temperature by about a sixth of a degree Kelvin. Uh, per decade, and for those of you who aren't familiar with the conversion from metric um, to English units, you just multiply this by about a factor of two to get Fahrenheit. So this is about a third of a degree Fahrenheit per decade. And to translate that, what that means is that over a century, uh, we're looking at about three degrees Fahrenheit increase in the temperature of the, of the lower Earth's atmosphere. And at the same time, the atmosphere is getting moister. And this is completely consistent with thermodynamic laws. Now, how does this look in the context of history if we now we can actually use records uh, to go back and place this recent time period, the last 150 years, in context? And those records, fortunately, go back literally hundreds of thousands of years thanks to data that we have from ice cores. I won't go into those long records. I'll just show you the last uh, roughly 1,000 years, basically the period of uh, starting with the Middle Ages, William the Conqueror, up to the present day. And you can reconstruct the temperature at the Earth's surface by drilling boreholes into it and by using other lines of evidence that are known as proxies. We, we obviously don't have temperature records since before the, the invention of the thermometer, but we can estimate, we can sort of calibrate these proxies using modern day thermometers and then run backwards to see how temperature has changed. And what these proxies indicate is that it's very likely that the last five, 50 years have been the warmest in the last 500. So basically since um, the period of King Henry VIII. This is an unusually warm period. And this you know, same conclusion applies the deeper you go into the past. So the Earth's atmosphere is warming, and this is unusual. Some of the data that we have is a lot more recent. It depends on the use of satellites. Since the invention of satellites, and these really, uh, a lot of these satellites just came online uh, really in the, in the 1980s, we've been able to map the, the Arctic and the Antarctic in unprecedented detail. And this is a, a map of the sea ice coverage shown in this sort of white and purple color derived from a modern NASA sensor. And so our satellite records, unfortunately, only go back 20 years but they show a very steady and rapid decrease in the amount of ice covering the Arctic uh, over this 25-year uh, time period. And the, the rate of this decrease is pretty fast. It's about 7.5% per decade. So again, if you project out a century, and if this trend continues, we're looking at a reduction in sea ice cover by three quarters by the end of the century. And I'll, I'll come back to this point a little bit later in my talk. So this is also quite a, um, a fast trend in the climate system. And it's one you would expect. Obviously, ice melts when you heat it up. There are also trends in land glaciers. I, I started off by talking about the, the glaciers in Glacier National Park. Uh, obviously, those glaciers are you know, appreciated for their scenic beauty. But these glaciers are very important for uh, their input into our water supply. Boulder, where I just moved from, gets a third of its water from the Rapo Glacier, which sits in the, the foothills of the Rockies immediately west of Boulder. And there are uh, billions of people, literally, in, the, uh, in India, Pakistan, and Afghanistan who depend on the, the, uh, the glaciers nearby for their water supply. So what's been happening to those glaciers? Well, if we start as a, at a baseline of the year 1900, so the beginning of the 20th century, and we sort of adjust all the, the and we, add, we, we say, let's start from this, 
we're going to assume that all the glaciers have 100% of their surface area. How has that surface area decreased? Well, it's decreased by 80% to the present day. In other words, we've gone from 100% of their surface area in 1900 to 20% at the present day. So again, a very rapid decrease. This applies to essentially all the major uh, glaciers on Earth. And this is one example in India where the, retreat, the glaciers are retreating at the rate of a kilometer every couple of decades. So it's really melting pretty quickly. And this is a, a tongue of ice in a valley uh, in the um, mountains in northern India. So rapid decrease, and this decrease may account for about a quarter of the increase in sea level that we're seeing. So let me talk about sea level. Again, we're fortunate that our predecessors took a lot of measurements. Some of these weren't really of laboratory quality, but we can use them to estimate how sea level has risen. This is about a third of a, of a meter, which is about a foot of sea level right here. This vertical axis corresponds to about a foot. And what we've seen is a steady increase uh, since, again, the middle of the 19th century up to the present day. We have crude data taken from a variety of shoreline stations and then modern tide gauges and then now we have very comprehensive satellite altimetry that measures the ocean's surface altitude at all times of day, 24 hours a day, seven days a year. And uh, this record is all very consistent and it, it points to an increase in sea level. Now, you've, this is one of the aspects of climate change that's been in the news quite a bit because it affects people who live in coastal regions. About half the US population lives within a few miles of shore. And there are other countries that are completely dependent on the fact that the ocean is not changing in altitude. Uh, one of these countries where I've been to do an experiment is the Maldives. This is a beautiful coral atoll in the middle of the Indian Ocean, uh, just north of the equator. Has a population of just under 40,000 people and a mean elevation of, of just under two meters, or just under six feet. And to give you an idea of what 30 centimeters of rise will do to the, to the Maldives, they are actually uh, considering having to move on mass from the Maldives. In other words, this, this island uh, atoll will, go, uh, will be um, unpopulated by the end of the century if present trends continue. So sea level right now is, is rising at the rate of about three millimeters a year, which is tiny. It's about the stack of three dimes. But again, add that up, that becomes 30 millimeters over a century, uh, which is, uh, you know, starts to get appreciable. It's about a foot. So now I need to, uh, I've shown you some evidence for how climate is changing. I need to talk a little bit about why it's changing. And I'll explain this in terms of the energy budget of the Earth. So the energy budget is kind of like an economy. You have the input of sunlight and you have the output of heat. And that's, those inputs and outputs are not quantities we can measure, again, directly from satellite. This is a satellite map of the amount of sunlight incident on the Earth from space. And this is the amount of heat being emitted to space from a, a modern NASA satellite. And I just wanted to illustrate to you that we now have the capacity to measure this data and monitor it continuously. And we're looking for changes in the energy budget with time. So you can see that there are fluctuations in here. These are associated with clouds. You can clearly see the continents. You can see the oceans, which are a little bit more cloud-free. Some of the other features in here to note are the, the clouds over the roaring 40s and howling 50s in the storm tracks around Antarctica. Um, you can see the bright deserts of the Sahara, the convection over the, uh, over the Amazon. So a lot of features that you can pick up by eye. And I don't want to go into the details, so I'm not going to go into the details of this graph or anything, but let me just point out that the reason why we have a habitable Earth is because of trace chemicals in the Earth's atmosphere. So the, the blanket effect of the Earth, which is known as the greenhouse effect, is due to chemical compounds that are literally measured in parts per billion or trillion. So as you may know from high school chemistry, 98% of the Earth's atmosphere is made up of oxygen and nitrogen. That does not cause the greenhouse effect. It's these trace chemicals that are caused the greenhouse effect. The other th key thing to note, uh, to remember about the Earth's energy budget is that the Earth likes to be in balance. And so under normal circumstances, meaning before humans came on the scene, the amount of uh, sunlight coming in and the amount of heat going out on long time scales were roughly in equilibrium or in balance. And we can change that um, by either putting more particulates into the atmosphere, which reflects sunlight back to space, or by increasing the concentrations of these greenhouse gases. So what's happened to the chemical composition of the Earth's atmosphere? And again, we're 
lucky that we have these excellent records of the Earth's climate from ice cores. Ice cores, uh, you might ask, well, what's the virtue in having a, a piece of ice from a glacier? Well, the virtue of that piece of ice is that it has air trapped in it, in bubbles. And you can go in and analyze the amount of greenhouse gases in those bubbles and literally map out uh, for hundreds of thousands of years the chemical composition of the Earth's atmosphere. And in the very near future, we will have a record from Antarctica that goes down to bedrock, which is about a, so it's a time series that's a, a million years long of the Earth's chemical composition. And I'm just showing you a very short portion of that, of that record. Starting from the last glacial maximum, this is when, for example, we think people cross the Bering Strait into, uh, north, into Alaska, into North America. So this is um, back at the time of the cave paintings in France. Uh, up 10,000 years, this is when we believe that humans first began forming agrarian societies. And of course, biblical times are back, uh, sort of starting from 5,000 years on up. So this record goes back uh, well into our own history, well uh, beyond our written history. And what I'm showing you uh, is the amount of the concentration of carbon dioxide, which is the primary greenhouse gas in the Earth's atmosphere, and another important greenhouse gas, methane, as a function of time going from 20,000 years before present up to present day. I don't want you to worry about the, the vertical axes. The, the, the main thing to notice is that the concentration didn't change very much, and it changed, by, it changed fairly slowly up until the present day. And then it took off very rapidly. The gray bar on these graphs shows you the total variation in this concentration of, of this greenhouse gas over 650,000 years. So this goes back uh, well into the period before we think that human beings walked off the African continent. And this spike that's occurred in the last 150 years is equal to the magnitude of that variation over 650,000 years. So something is happening fairly, uh, fairly rapidly and fairly dramatically to the composition of the Earth's atmosphere. Now let me, I'm going to translate this into a concept that I deal with, uh, which is the concept of radiative forcing. And I don't want you to really worry about the term radiative, I just want you to worry about the term forcing. But the way that climate scientists view people, and I guess this is a reflection of the fact that we're physical scientists, is that people are sort of like, a, um, we're a, we're disturbance on the natural climate system. And that's what we call this a forcing. We're sort of forcing the climate to do something it wouldn't normally do. And what we're showing you is that, remember I talked to you about the concept of the Earth's energy budget? This is how we're changing the amount of heat being trapped in the Earth's atmosphere since uh, the middle of the 18th century. And the, again, I don't want you to worry about the units. Just to put this in context, one tick mark on this graph is equal to a Christmas tree light bulb per square meter of the Earth's surface, or roughly one Christmas tree, uh, tree light bulb per square yard on the Earth's surface. It's a tiny, tiny disturbance to the Earth's energy budget. But this is our reconstruction based on that chemical evidence, plus some other calculations, of how we have increased the, greenhouse, the amount of energy being trapped by the Earth's atmosphere, the greenhouse effect of the Earth's atmosphere. And we call this a forcing. And this is what, I'll come back to this point in a minute, we now believe we have very good evidence that this is the primary driver for those changes that I showed you at the beginning of the talk, the increases in temperature, the decrease in sea ice, and so forth. So I'm going to do two things in this talk. I've started off by talking about how the climate has been disturbed. I'm now going, trying to work my way back up to the causes, and we're talking about this concept of radiative forcing, how human beings might be altering the energy budget. And I'm going to come to a minute in who's responsible for this, nature, or man. And then when I, when I look forward into the future, I'm going to start, and I'm going to go the other way, I'm going to start with how we think we might change the composition of the Earth's atmosphere in the future, how that will force the climate, and how the climate will respond. So again, I'm, I'm sorry I'm showing you so many graphs from the IPCC, but uh, I really want, I, the message I want you to take away is that these graphs are the synthesis of the work of hundreds of people, and we think at, at least from our perspective, that they form a case beyond a reasonable doubt um, that humans are the, res are the agents for climate change. Let me, uh, before I prejudice the case though, let me show you um, the increase in carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. So one of the things we know for an absolute fact is that the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been increasing steadily uh, since we've been able to measure it. 
And these are measurements made from a station in Mauna Loa. And the, the black curve is the thing I want you to focus on now. It's the concentration of carbon dioxide. You can see the seasonal cycle associated with the activity of uh, plants on the land masses in the northern hemisphere, which caused this big cycle. Uh, but the main thing to notice is that it's been increasing. And it's now at this, it's, uh, this is actually, it's gone off graph now. Um, the concentrations are above 380 parts per million uh, in the year 2006, if I remember correctly. So why do we think this is due to people as opposed to some sort of natural increase? Because after all, I've shown you direct evidence that carbon dioxide, increase, carbon dioxide has changed quite a bit in, in the past before mankind would have been able to influence it. There are two lines of evidence. One of them is that the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere is decreasing. Now, not to worry, we're not going to, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't start breathing, you know, don't start breathing heavily now. I mean, this is a very tiny change in the amount of oxygen. But it is consistent with the combustion of fossil fuels. And the other more direct and, and in my mind, compelling evidence is that there's, um, carbon comes in different flavors, or what are known as different isotopes. And the isotopes that you find that are, um, so this is, this refers to the, the mass of the nucleus of a carbon atom. And the, for various reasons, the isotopes that you find that are exchanged among plants and animals in the ocean have a certain flavor of carbon, or a certain isotope characteristic. And the carbon that's stored in fossil fuels, because it's been out of contact with the systems for so long, has a sort of a different uh, mix of these flavors of, of carbon. And the, we're seeing a change in that mix of carbon, dox, of carbon in the atmosphere, which can essentially only be explained by the release of carbon from reservoirs that are uh, comprised of fossil carbon. You, you really can't explain the signal that we're seeing if it comes from uh, plants and animals, at least not easily. So we think these are two lines of, of pretty good evidence, the decrease in oxygen and the change in this mix of carbon atoms in the atmosphere that both point to fossil fuels as being the culprit. So I've been sort of hammering on this issue of um, who's responsible. And there are, there are a couple of other agents which may uh, play, be playing a role, one of which is the sun. The sun does not put out the same amount of light day to day, year to year, or decade to decade, or even century to century. And we know that there was a period in the uh, late 17th century called the Modern Minimum, which is sort of uh, Europe's miniature ice age. And it got very cold. This is the period of uh, you know, Cromwell and the upheaval in England, for example. It got uh, appreciably colder all over Europe. And this is very well recorded. You can even see evidence for it in paintings. Uh, so there's sort of a, a climatic art history in a way that's it's used to look at some of these issues. So the sun can change, and its output has changed uh, over time. We can now reconstruct that using modern satellite records. And the evidence is that it's changed by a bit, but not much, about 0.04% since um, 1700. So it's a, that's a tiny change. But it, this is the input into the Earth's climate system. So the fact that this is increasing could be an explanation for the heating. Because remember, this is the input. It's the driver for the climate system. Uh, I want This graph is way too technical. But the other thing that's going on is that they're volcanic eruptions. These are episodic. They don't, we don't think they have a big impact on the, on the climate system as a whole uh, on, on the long term. And so this is a graph that I will not go through in detail except to point out that we are, um, I won't even go through the, the details of this graph really except to point out that we're now confident that the, the energy budget of the planet has been tipped in a way that it is now out of balance and that the, there's more energy going into the climate system than going out. And we think this is very likely. It's greater than 90%. We're still not sure about some of the, the short-lived forcing agents. These are atmospheric aerosols. We still can't really uh, explain those in great detail, but we're quite confident about this finding. And if you put more energy into the system, it should heat. That's uh, you know, but sort of a by analogy with the first law of thermodynamics. So, which of these agents is responsible for the recent climate change? It could be human pollution, it could be solar variability, it could be volcanic eruptions. Well, how do we try to tease this apart? Because after all, we have only one Earth, and we can't really uh, go back and query the Earth's climate system in order to, in essence, tease it apart. So the way that we do this is with climate models. And you can think of using a climate model to try to reproduce the Earth's past, which is normally what we do. We can also use it 
to sort of play a game of simulation Earth, where we play what if we um, play what if games with the climate model. And one of the models that we've used for this is a climate model we developed in INCAR. And the, I, I want you to ignore all the details on this except to point out that this model is in the public domain. You're welcome to everything from it, the source code, the data, uh, all our publications. If you want to run it on, try running it on your Mac, um, you're welcome to. Um, it'll run slowly, but I think it will compile and run. <laughs> um, so uh, climate modelers are now trying to move into a mode where we're sharing more and more of our data. And one of the reasons why these assessments are possible, by the way, is that we are now in a modern mode of, of really making these tools available to anyone who wants to use them. So this is one of the models that we've used to assess what's happened in the past. And so we ran one of these what-if experiments. And what I'm showing you is the result of the experiments for the globe, for the global land, and for the global ocean. And there are three lines on these graphs. One of them is the change in the Earth's temperature from the observations that's shown in black. And, and again, this is all in metric. So if you wanted to convert it to Fahrenheit, just again, multiply this by about a factor of two. Then we ran an experiment with a climate model where we put in, every, we sort of threw in the kitchen sink. We put in all the natural and all the man-made forcings that we, we, we know how to reconstruct. And that is the magenta curve. And as you can see, over the globe, over the land, and over the ocean, those model simulations, and there are 23 different models that are represented on these graphs, those agree quite well with the data. The other experiment that we've run is when we, we take, we remove all the man-made forcings and we just allow the sun to change and we include volcanic eruptions, the ones that we know how to reconstruct. And you'll notice that, that those simulations do reasonably well up until about 1960, 1970. And at that point, they, their difference relative to the observations becomes very statistically significant. We cannot explain the recent warming if you only include natural causes. And so the conclusion here, based on a large number of models, which have very different assumptions about some of the basic aspects of the climate, um, so this is in some sense exploring our uncertainty about how to represent the physics of the climate, but regardless of that uncertainty, uh, the models with only natural forcings do not, and as far as we know, cannot reproduce the observations. And it's very likely, again, at greater than 90% confidence level, that people are the cause of recent warming. So I think um, based on this, you know, the question is well, what, what's going to happen in the future? So now I want to talk uh, about probably what you came to hear about, which is what's going to happen in the future. And I, I want to end on an optimistic note, but I'm afraid this is the part of the talk that's going to be uh, sobering. So, um, but I, I want to also emphasize before we, I show you this that I am an optimist at heart. And uh, so I'll, I'll, I will just point out that I think, in my opinion, um, I'm going to give you an editorial message now before I show you this stuff. Uh, there, there are no fundamental physical or chemical laws that stand in our way of addressing this issue. Uh, it's only a matter of political and social will. So with that um, optimistic message in mind, <laughs> I, I think it is optimistic. Let me start by showing you uh, just our projections of what might happen to the Arctic. Because I showed you some satellite data of, of the Arctic a little earlier in my talk and pointed out that the sea ice has been declining. So let's ask what happens if we now step forward in time. The ice basically goes from being a little over a meter thick down to uh, no thickness. In other words, it disappears by the end of the 21st century. Uh, and it's interesting, you know, uh, there was just an article this morning in the New York Times that Canada is now starting to really uh, patrol actively parts of the Arctic because they, they're, they're starting to think about how far their, their, uh, their territorial waters extend because this is going to become a real issue. Um, so there are lots of challenges moving forward. Um, what's going to happen to the globe? And remember, I, I pointed out that climate scientists tend to like to think global, and then we, we scope down to the regional. So let me start with the global. And one of the, the major sources of uncertainty for us that actually is bigger than the differences among climate models is uh, what path people will take going into the future. And we really don't know that. So we've constructed a variety of scenarios for what might happen. And those ex scenarios end up, remember, we, um, we treat people as if there's some sort of external disturbance in the climate system. So everything gets translated into the changes in chemical composition of the Earth's atmosphere. So we view people just as a means of changing. When I say we, I mean climate scientists. 
We view people as just a means of changing their chemical composition. I know that's weird, but that's, that's what we do. And so what we're showing you is how the chemical composition of the Earth's atmosphere will change because of various choices that human society might make. And those range from sort of a, a fairly progressive trajectory where human societies unite and begin taking uh, concerted action to reduce emissions. And this one actually has a reduction in emissions um, by uh, 2040 or so. And then other trajectories that are a little bit more like business as usual and ones where we pursue a fairly independent and fossil fuel intensive trajectory, uh, much like we're doing now. And so we can't, you know, as climate scientists, we really can't, we're not sociologists, we can't presume to, add, to, to guess which one of these trajectories humankind will follow. So we actually simulate all of them and then let, uh, present this information to the policymakers and let policymakers try to decide which trajectory they think is best. Um, so that, <laughs> that's, that's what we've done. And uh, what you find here are the consequences of these choices. So if you were actually able to just freeze the amount of, of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere to its present concentration, uh, oddly enough, the climate would continue to warm. This is an important thing for people to realize. This is not like air quality where you, know, you can have great fluctuations in, in the amount of ozone or particulate pollution in the atmosphere from one day to the next. Carbon dioxide has a, has a lifetime of about a century in the Earth's atmosphere. Chlorofluorocarbons, which we cleverly introduced, uh, they weren't present in nature before, have lifetimes measured in millennia. And so they're going to be there for a long time, and they will continue to warm the climate for a, a long time. So we, even if we stopped changing the composition of the Earth's atmosphere, it'll continue to warm. But fortunately, that warming is pretty slow. And again, this is all expressed as a change relative to the year 2000. So this is 2000 is zero on this graph, and then we go up to about 4 degrees centigrade, which is about 8 degrees Fahrenheit. And then depending on which scenario we choose, we go from about you know, one, and a, uh, one and a half up to about 3 degrees Kelvin or 6 degrees Fahrenheit change in the globe. Um, that gets manifested, if you look region by region, very differently. Um, this is going from sort of eco, so the eco-green scenario to the more fossil fuel intensive scenario top to bottom. The major things to point out about this is that you can see as you go to higher concentrations of carbon dioxide, the planet at the end of the 21st century gets systematically warmer. The Arctic is changed dramatically. Under all these scenarios, it gets warmer by about um, 12 to 15 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the reason why the ice is going to uh, disappear. Land systematically gets warmer than the oceans because it has a much lower heat capacity. Uh, and um, the other thing I want to point out is that, I, I made this point a little bit earlier, about two-thirds of the warming we're going to see, even as far as 2030, is from historical changes. So it's sort of baked into the climate system. We've already changed the composition, and those changes will continue to roll forward uh, through the next um, two decades. So there's very little difference. Uh, this is the quandary, I think, for politicians. Um, and it's sort of the challenge for, for society as well. Our choices in the immediate future, so if we decided to you know, institute crippling uh, taxes on, on gasoline, um, you know, the, the challenge here is that you won't see any consequences from, double, from paying twice as much at the pump over the next 25 years. And so the question is, how long can we sustain our political will to take action? Because you won't see any uh, effect from that in the near future. Pretty much it doesn't matter what you do. It makes a big difference to the children of your grandchildren, what you do. So that's the challenge, or one of the challenges. I pointed out that Arctic sea ice will be dramatically affected. And um, I won't go through the details of this graph. Let's just focus on the pictures. This is the amount of uh, the coverage of sea ice in the summer in the year 2000. This is what happens in the year 2100 under sort of a business as usual scenario. Drastic reductions. Um, I suppose if you're interested in sort of shipping around here, this is good news. Um, it's, it has, uh, but I should point out that the, those, those ports are going to be resting on, on uh, permafrost, which is melted down to uh, quite a considerable depth. So whether or not they're able to, able to build sustainable infrastructure for shipping is another question. This whole area is going to melt. There's, there are 10 million square kilometers that are going to melt uh, under this scenario. <coughs> sea level, this is again an issue that's come up quite a bit. Uh, sea level will increase depending on whether you're sort of an ecologically friendly or more fossil fuel intensive scenario, anywhere from about 30 up to over 40 centimeters. 
I uh, remember two feet is about 30 centimeters in this graph. Looking out further, there's some concern that we may put Greenland into a tipping point where out after about um, a millennium or so, it will more or less melt. Uh, once it does that, it will commit about six meters of a, uh, seven meters of additional sea level rise. Um, so uh, you'll lose large portions of the eastern seaboard of the United States, for example, under that scenario. Uh, last thing I want to touch on, and then I'm going to um, just very briefly mention our plans at the end in order to leave time for questions. Um, climate is going to also get a little bit more extreme. Uh, so it's not just a change in sort of the mean. There will also be more extreme events. And the ones that we've looked at have mostly involved temperature and precipitation. Uh, so these are three different scenarios, again, going from sort of um, less fossil fuel intensive to more fossil fuel intensive from the upper left down to the lower left. And there are increases in the number of heat, uh, in the duration of heat waves of up to two months with heat waves over five degrees Kelvin warmer than the climatological mean. Uh, so we're looking, you know, essentially looking at sort of a permanent, really hot summer um, under some of these more fossil fuel uh, intensive scenarios. This is also true in Europe. Uh, Europe. The area around the Mediterranean looks identical to this. It's just it's a heat wave, you know, all summer long. Um, precipitation gets, uh, uh, when you have strong rainstorms, it gets more intense. There are, uh, in some cases, 10, uh, percent increase in these very violent rainstorms, but there's also uh, large increases in the periods of basically no rainfall, uh, stretches of up to a week or more, a week and a half, when you'll see almost essentially no rain. So you'll see this sort of change in rainfall patterns where when it rains, it's, it's more intense. When it doesn't rain, it lasts for a longer period of time. And so the question then is, uh, in all seriousness, what do we, what do, we do about this? So my motivation for moving out here was to begin connecting the climate modeling that we've been doing to addressing, sort of moving out of being on the ivory tower and looking at how physical climate will change, to begin worrying about the, the issue of how do we connect this to action. And I'll skip this in order just to point out that we are in the process of forming a center for integrated earth system modeling uh, with my colleagues here at Lawrence Berkeley Lab and in conjunction with uh, UC Berkeley and partnering actually with the whole UC system and my, par my colleagues back at the National Science Foundation. And our goal is to continue focusing on climate, but to move consequences, policy, and actions to address this front and center, and also understand really how ecosystems will be uh, affected. We have not really built a system that's been designed so far to connect the kind of science that I've done in the past on physical climate to its impacts and to action. And so we, we actually are, are literally, uh, in the IPCC assessment that we just conducted, those three groups never met. And in fact, when we did meet, when we, we met by ourselves, we typically met eight time zones away from the other working groups. Um, so we need to begin sitting down together, I think, in my opinion, in order to uh, figure out how to link climate to policy. And, I, and in the process, I actually think that will allow us to build even better climate models. I think the challenge for us moving forward is we, we have really strong evidence that climate has changed. We have very strong evidence that people are the cause of this change and that the consequences for the physical climate in the future are serious uh, and that the, the impacts on human beings, plants, and animals are all uh, potentially dramatic, although it won't be the end of life as we know it. And so we, we can make a choice. Um, and the challenge is are we ready to make that choice? And what we're planning to do here at this laboratory is connect our research and new energy technology directly with the climate modeling that we're doing in order to begin to address those questions. So with that, I'd like to conclude and take your questions. Thanks very much. Me, I'm going to question you on the time scale, but you're absolutely correct. Um, Newton's laws are, are pretty ironclad. And they, what they imply is that the Earth, the amount of sunlight received by the northern hemisphere changes steadily with time. And there are cycles known as Milankovitch cycles that alter the amount of sunlight that's received by uh, the northern hemisphere and also how that, how that is phased with regards to the annual cycle. And if you go back and look at the ice core record, you can see the direct impact of those variations in the solar input for the Earth's climate. And that's recorded in the ice core data. 
Now, uh, fortunately, because we have that ex excellent record and we have Newton's laws and the solar system is not chaotic on time scales of a, of a million years, we know when the next ice age is going to come. And it's not going, we would not enter another ice age for another 30,000 years. So we're going to be living with the consequences of this um, for millennia. And the problem is, you know, that as I pointed out, some of the more serious consequences, for example, the melting of Greenland, will occur on the time scale of a millennium. So I don't think uh, orbital dynamics is going to ride to the rescue here, unfortunately. Uh, that actually is, uh, that is close to the consensus projection for uh, the most recent, this most recent assessment. And it's, it's fully consistent. I mean, it's dangerous to take present day trends and extrapolate them. But present day trends are consistent with about a 30, uh, 30 centimeter rise in sea level by the end of the century. And I should point out that um, there's evidence that those trends may have been underestimated uh, because we're still grappling with how to uh, understand and model uh, glaciers on land. And there's, um, there's a very real likelihood that Greenland may be more unstable than we think. Greenland right now is losing somewhere between 100 and 200 cubic kilometers of ice every year, which is, when you think about it, that's a huge volume of ice. And the, the reason it's doing that, it, people thought for a while this is just because it's melting. It's just like a big ice cube. Well, no, it turns out that it's flowing out to sea. And there are several, uh, there's one major uh, opening that's allowing the ice to flow out to the uh, western part of the Greenland ice sheet. Unfortunately, there are, more, uh, there are more channels for the ice to flow out of that are currently blocked. And if those get unblocked, we don't know what, what's going to happen. So it's possible you know, th that these estimates I'm quoting you may be underestimates. Well, I think, I mean, the, the question about particulars is an excellent one. And for example, uh, you know, we could get lucky and then see an unusual uh, burst of vul volcanism this century. Uh, and there's also been suggestions that we should cool the Earth's climate by injecting particulates into the Earth's atmosphere. It's so-called geoengineering. So uh, particulates, these, these aerosol particles, um, do have a dramatic impact on climate. That statement that I made earlier about being, that we think it's very likely that we're heating the Earth's climate, that includes a, a full treatment of the uncertainty in, in aerosols, and in fact, a very generous uncertainty bar on that. And that uncertainty has been propagated through the calculation so we've accounted for that in this statement. Um, that said, this is an area where m many of us, including a lot of people at this lab, are working very actively to understand the aerosols. And I think you're right to address it as a major uncertainty. Uh, I think we, um, we have a number of other lines of evidence that the climate has been warming, the ocean heat content has increased, so it's really hard to explain what's going on if somehow particulates are going to you know, have, it's, it's very hard to reconcile the record unless it's greenhouse gases that are driving it. And the reason is that particulates tend to cool the Earth's climate. What we're seeing is a heating. Everything we're seeing is a heating. And the particulates in the aggregate tend to cool. So there's also a sign issue. You really can't explain the historical record if aerosols are somehow the dominant thing we're doing to the chemical composition of the Earth's atmosphere. Speaker is asking about some suggestions that have been ra uh, raised recently, uh, including by the Nobel laureate Paul Crutzen, who was the, uh, one of the three people awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for discovering the uh, chemical mechanism behind the ozone hole. And he's worried that we will not develop the political will in time, and so we need a, a Band-Aid. And that Band-Aid would take the form of, uh, there have been some interesting suggestions made. One of them is to uh, create an essentially an artificial volcano. So we would flood the stratosphere with tiny particles that would reflect sunlight. Now remember, this is, we, have an, we have an energy balance for the Earth, and so we would be lowering the input side of the energy budget. It'd be, it would just be like turning down the sun a little bit. Um, and there have been, <laughs> you'd laugh, but there have been suggestions about putting a, a huge sun shield into a, something called a Lagrange point, which is a a point in the Earth-Moon system where you could, you could stick a Mylar shield a thousand kilometers in diameter and literally block the sun's rays from hitting the Earth. Um, my reaction to the particular idea is um, I, um, 
I think it's deeply irrational. I think it's the kindest thing I can say about it. The, um, <laughs> the reason I say that is that the, uh, we know from looking at the, the, the way that the cirrus formed by airplanes affect the stratosphere and the way that polar stratospheric clouds cause the ozone hole, that if you stick particles into the, into the upper atmosphere, chemical reactions will occur on the surface of those particles. And those chemical reactions may not be beneficial for the stability of the stratosphere. And the ozone hole is a perfect example. The ozone hole, uh, part of the dynamics behind that is the chemistry that occurs on these tiny, on these fairly wispy clouds called polar stratospheric clouds. And what we're talking about with geoengineering is increasing the amount of reactive surface area where chemical reactions could occur by orders of magnitude and sustaining that for decades, if not centuries. The consequences of that for the stratospheric chemistry are, at this point, unknown. And I, so that's one of the reasons why I, I, I really think it would just be better for us to do the simple thing, which is stop emitting greenhouse gases. We, we know that uh, the emissions of some of the chlorofluorocarbons have, have rolled off. Um, this is because of the Montreal Protocols. So we have direct evidence uh, that some of those species are beginning, that those emissions are declining. Um, and the, I should point out that the, you know, these scenarios that we ran to look at different possibilities for the future uh, are still broadly consistent with what's, what's happening. There have been some strange things that have happened recently, but the scenarios are still broadly consistent with the current trends. Um, China is on its, you know, China is on a pathway to, um, in fact, I believe may have already exceeded the United States as an emitter of carbon dioxide, and by the year 2020 will dominate the world's emissions of sulfate particulates. Those effects are included in the scenarios that we use. So we have accounted for some of these recent shifts in socioeconomic activity. I'm not sure if that answers your question, though. Well, I know people in Berkeley have a pretty narrow temperature comfort range. <laughs> <laughs> So, you, um, I know you probably think that life as we know it will end once it gets warmer than 85 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> uh, but I can assure you that it won't. I mean, um, there was just a story on NPR recently about uh, Phoenix, where they're you know they're surviving temperature you know days where it gets up to 115 degrees Fahrenheit. It can certainly get a lot warmer. Um, my concern here is really not. I'm not. I th Frankly, I think people will land on their feet. Uh, what I'm very concerned about is the effect on plants and animals, which uh, plants and animals d you know, don't understand what's going on. And there, there are whole ecosystems that are being, I think, decimated is a fair word, because they can't move fast enough to get out of the way of the warming. Uh, this century, if you come back and look at it, if, if there are people around 100,000 years from now, and they come back and look at this century in the, in the fossil record, this century will look exactly like the impact of a major meteor in terms of the impact, in terms of the, the mass extinction of, of the web of life. And that, I think, is, is what concerns me more than anything else about this. It's not people. It's what we're doing at the ecosystem. And we, we don't really understand how far we can stress that ecosystem before uh, we begin to break critical links in it. I think that's another key question for us. There is evidence now that because the ocean is becoming more acidic in response to the increased carbon dioxide, that we're beginning to threaten the uh, ability of single-celled organisms that use Calcium compounds is to form exoskeletons for those uh, microorganisms to survive, because calcium carbonate likes to dissolve and you know will dissolve as you make the ocean more acidic. Well, that's the base uh, of the ocean food chain. So I'll just leave you with that thought. Uh, that's an issue that scientists are beginning to look at very actively. Did Jim, yeah, I should bounce this question to a colleague of mine, but uh, again, I think uh, who, who's an expert on ocean biogeochemistry. Um, Jim, let me just give you, uh, give the, uh, sort of the Reader's Digest version of your answer. Um, <laughs> again, we think that is a, uh, that idea won't work, and it is extremely ill-advised. However, it is unfortunately becoming very popular. I think we will, um, you, you, we're going to see, I think, a, a, a vast array of uh, snake oil that's being sold as carbon credits. And so, 
you're going to see a land rush that looks a lot like snake oil uh, in the, at the end of the, of the 19th century. You'll be able to buy carbon credits you know, when you go into Walmart um, for your, your plastic toy made in China. And I, I think we have to view those, those mechanisms with a great deal of skepticism. Uh, this is something where essentially the consumers need to educate themselves because you know, what a great way to make a profit. You know, here, click here. You know, I don't have to feel guilty about flying on an airplane. Um, I mean, that's, you know, that's something where the buyer needs to be beware. If we were looking at something where a, a, a basic law of physics or chemistry said that we, we cannot reduce emissions, then I, I would agree that we're in deep trouble. Um, but we have the technology in hand to make dramatic reductions in emissions and make them you know, pretty much immediately. Uh, California started taking action on those, you know, along those lines. Conservation is an easy, uh, well, it's not easy, but it is a, a way to very quickly begin to reduce emissions, and the potential there is, is enormous. But California, fortunately, is going to pretty much make um, incandescent light bulbs a thing of the past by the end of this decade. That's a huge savings. So the, I mean, I, I know it's naive to think that human nature can change overnight, but there are excellent precedents, recent historical precedents, that when humanity is challenged in this way, that we can take action quickly. Uh, look at what happened with uh, acid rain. That problem was addressed very quickly and very aggressively. Well, look at what happened with the ozone hole. Again, nations realized that this was a critical problem. It was a life-threatening problem, and they took action. Now, I mean, there was some knock-on effects. They, they substituted one greenhouse gas for another, but at least we're no longer depleting the ozone. And well, the ozone, you know, the ozone hole will recover by, the, by around 2065. So there are, there are some really good recent examples where humanity collectively decided to take action. And that's the reason why I'm optimistic.